the, um, the advice literature. So I'm starting with their discipline, and I'm going through the, his um, pieces in Herald of Holiness, and then I look at books and family, the newsletters, and all the books and videos, and everything that came out after that. So the study of like the not Dobson the man uh, necessarily, but what Dobson and folks in the family have <coughs> produced and the message they have for <coughs> So it's like a different uh, project than he has. Uh, mine is not chronological. Um, um, I focus on different topics in each chapter, the chronological in each chapter. But, um, yes. Uh, I can not think I can say a little bit of how it my project fits into the larger development in, in research on evangelicalism, the Christian right these days. Um, I, um, I'm looking at how these, you know, the, one of the main topics is like how the, the move from uh, the denominational identities to the more parent church or pan-denominational uh, identity is, has shifted the past 50 or 60 years. So I'm looking at like how family and family values has replaced these denominational boundaries from talking about holiness or um, talking about fundamentals and like all these different things. So people across different denominations talk about the family as like a really important cultural symbol for conservative Protestants in general. So I'm now looking into how like one of these biggest groups that have helped building this sub this subcultural identity like that Judith Smith and Mendesella Gallagher talks about. Um, so I'm looking at how, like, how has this been negotiated? How have, how has the these idea, uh, the, this idea of the family as the base of this for um, Christianity and civilization? How, how, like, have you argued for this in, in these different books? So, um, yeah, so that's, a, that's a basic overall thing. Um, and my chapters have. Um, chapter that looks at how like this move from the Cold War rhetoric to the cultural rhetoric, rhetoric um, and the connections between what happened in the 50s and 60s and then Dobson coming out with their discipline in the 70s and like the up these, these re this rhetoric has been updated as issues of racial reconciliation back in the 80s and 90s came up how gay rights became a big issue especially in the 90s and 2000s sex education um, that's a fun chapter. <laughs> um, anyone who's ever read, read preparing for adolescence uh, might remember some of the things um, in this work there. So um, let's see what else. Um, it's education, race, sexuality, uh, and also um, working moms, the mommy wards, and how Dobson folks in the family had to like slightly change their way they talked about working mothers um, because such a small number of people in the audience were working mothers, that were, were uh, stay-at-home mothers, you know, so they could really uphold that. Yeah, so I'm looking at like how to, you know, hold on to an I ideal and with shifting reality. That's one of the some themes of my book. Um, so, let's see. Okay, so I, uh, I guess I can spend a little bit of time talking about the chapter where I try to connect the, the Cold War and the culture wars. Uh, where this whole like, doom and gloom um, rhetoric that the war is falling apart, uh, it's the end of the world, um, that kind of rhetoric it's all the time in Dobson's writing about the family. So I'm, I explain his understanding with um, Growing from the 50s to 60s with a Cold War paranoia of um, gender, like underneath the veneer of peace in America uh, and this like family-friendly culture, um, I base um, some of my writing on Elaine Tyler May's Homeward Bound. He talks about how like underneath this was the fear that uh, uncontrolled sexuality would be as dangerous to America as the atomic bomb. And uh, like a lot of the same rhetoric was used by Billy Graham, he and many of these big 
Parisian at the time. And Dobson, he basically updates this rhetoric for the culture war. Like in the 90s, he, he compared uh, teenage um, sexuality with uh, nuclear power and um, teenagers having sex. Uh, they were like as dangerous as the hydrogen bomb. You know, so it was like like literally picking up and rephrasing the culture war, uh, the cold rhetoric for the culture wars. Um, <coughs> So I'm like looking at thinking about like also the, the location of Dobson. Like he was in Pasadena in the 60s and early 70s. Um, and like the things that were going on in those circles. Before he really became known for being a family man, he was a professor uh, and he worked for Paul Papineau, who was America's um, most well-known marital expert at the time. He was one of the founders of the marital council movement in the 20s and 30s and 40s and like wrote for like his home journal and all these big magazines and had radio shows and like was really, really, um, he was a secular marital expert, but he was someone Dobson really um, saw as a mentor. And Dobson also had Paul Popineau write the, the preface for the Discipline. discipline. Hmm. Um, he didn't choose a preacher, he didn't choose a religious leader, he, cho he chose Paul Popineau. So, um, so I'm looking at like what kind of texts were circling in this time, at this time, and what kind of texts do Dobson write about in, <coughs> in their discipline. And one of the texts that really became prevalent among these conservatives in California was um, this address by a, a British social anthropologist from the early 20s, um, um, J.D. Unwin, who um, wrote this big, big book on how civilizations rise and fall. And he did this historical study where he um, <coughs> concluded that societies that have regulated, regulated societies flourish, like in their like, degrees of uh, civilized societies, the more regulated sexuality is, the more, free, uh, the more um, productive it is, the more um, successful it is. But <coughs> if uh, societies like move away from that, they collapse. And that's like this rhetoric that really became prevalent in this in this group of people in Southern California in the um, late 60s as this address was republished by a close friend of Paul Popineau. And uh, Dobson uses this on Wednesday that he like repeatedly over the years. And I've seen it spread to other people. Um, so here not only have like connection with the Cold War of like early 20th century's ideas of um, social unrest and how um, sexuality is key to <coughs> social order. So that's, um, yeah, that's one of the things, I guess. Yeah, so that's one of the basic topics, like how these, this idea of um, that sex is key to civilization. Like, um, so you have homosexuality becomes like a massive threat against this because, you know, that's like the logic behind the, you know, like the, idea that the world is falling apart. Um, I was reading all these responses to the Supreme Court decision this morning, and it's like, it's rhetoric, it's so there. Mm -hmm. um, and um, yeah, Dobson has really been really um, important in um, spreading that kind of ideology. Um, at the same time, as he really has had to um, say it in a way it's not offensive to the audience. Um, so it's uh, like he has like had this balance in that, like trying to say these really um, damning things uh, in a way that's um, a friendly a and popular. yeah, just like <laughs> <I'm not> <laughs> yeah. So there's like these balance in it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's Dr. Thompson. Um, so yeah, I guess I can wrap it up there and. Um, but we still have. Plenty of time, so let's let's have it at questions. Yeah. Um, I'm Sandy, and um, first of all, special welcome from Norway because I'm sending my son to Norway in a few months for a study abroad. I'm really excited about that. I'm just going to work, so uh, telemark region. Anyway, I'm new in San Diego, and I, my question has to do with if you know um, has certain churches kept the devil's music out since the 50s, you know, looking at this. Mm -hmm. Because I'm, I'm really fascinated. I came from the Lutheran tradition, 
And being a newbie in town, I was looking for a church home. Mm-hmm. So I visited different churches, and for the first time I heard all kinds of music. Mm-hmm. Music that was unknown to me, not mm-hmm. familiar. Mm-hmm. So I'm just curious to what tradition has kept yeah. in, in which churches and so on. You know. That's a really good question. I mean, that would be something that I probably will have to look into a little bit more. Because it's a real, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a minority, <coughs> but I think it's a vocal minority. Like, for instance, Bob Jones University would not allow Christian rock. Like, if you want something fun to do, take a look at their, their list of rules for men and women. This one of them was, um, it's, this is off topic, but one of them was, a young man can arrive on campus with a beard, but he can't grow a beard on campus. And a friend of mine said, maybe that's because of evolution. The beard evolves on campus. <laughs> but there are other things, like, you know, it gets really... Um, you know, because music is, it, 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 it's unclear, like, what, you know, are you going to allow drums, or are you going to allow a synthesizer, you know, are you going to allow a bass, are you going to allow electrification, amplification? Um, I mean, once you get beyond just the standard organ or a piano, uh, for, for, for these most conservative groups, for the more uh, fundamentalist ones, um, it, that's a no-go zone, you know. And it, growing up, you know, in the Nazarene Church, in the Wesleyan Church, I mean, I, I went to churches that were basically fundamentalist, you know, but they would have drums in there and, and uh, amplification. So it's not just fundamentalism, uh, or it's not just a kind of quasi-fundamentalism that means you can't have uh, music. It's, it's, it's something else. It's about the, uh, a church's relationship with the outside world or with the culture that they maybe perceive as a threat, I guess. Um, but I mean, I, I suppose if you went to churches around the San Diego area, I can't imagine that you'd find very many at all now that would have prohibitions on, um, like, rock or folk or uh, that kind of thing. I'm not sure. I don't really know. I mean, there are different kinds of rock. So. Yeah, soft rock. Soft rock. Air supply and everything. Have you seen, like, um, the church where I grew up, like, the old generation, like my grandma, they would accept electric guitars, electric basses, but not the drums. Mm-hmm. Because that's, that's, you know, that's where they drew the line. That really does, like, that ties into um, the beat. Mm-hmm. Uh, in the chapter about the jungle music, uh, I'm going to focus on the beat a lot, because the beat was the thing that, that mm-hmm. is definitely racialized. And, it's, mm-hmm. it, and it has religious connotations, because they say, like, the beat, this is like shamanism, this is like the music of witchcraft, it comes out of the jungles of Africa, you know. And a lot of times I think people would say that without really thinking too long and hard about what that really meant to say that kind of thing. Uh, but, um, there, I mean, the, I think even the Nazarene church produced some tracks. I remember seeing one by uh, Donald Metz about uh, <laughs> rock music sort of shouting down all the different kinds of beat-related music. But yeah, that's a good point. Drums. Hi, I'm Rebecca. And I have a question about Dobson. You know, as Dobson and many others have changed over time in terms of addressing different situations, has he written self-reflectively on <coughs> how he has changed on some of these issues? Okay, I'm see. Okay. I know, I've talked to, I met with um, some people and folks in the family. I was there in 2009. And I tried to, like, address, like, who cares they've changed over time because I've seen some, you know. Mm-hmm. And they're like, nope, it hasn't been changed. So there is this idea that it's coming straight from scripture, so it really can't change. <coughs> but I mean, they're all like, you know, with the thing with working mothers, like early 80s, we started having working mothers write about being, you know, being working mothers, how they, you know, felt about that. And after, after those pieces, we had like statements by Dawson on working mothers that is not, you know, that was not the model. But that completely disappeared mm-hmm. in the mid to late 80s. And in the 90s, we had like a really wide array of different um, mothers um, telling about their lives. Um, and you had women writing in complaining about how, how much focus there was on stay at home uh, moms. Others complained about like focus on working moms. And it really like, they really had to tiptoe around not to offend their audience because, you know, they can't survive without the $25 that people sending out and then. Um, but interesting, like with that, is um, like this seems to change on, um, on mothers, but 
when someone went so far as having a father at home and a mother at work, that's like that's where the dream line because that was like a complete upending of how things worked. And that's but working mothers became kind of a non-issue. Sorry, if I just ask another question. Um, I do remember seeing films when I was in high school about how I was supposed to be as a female and how the boys were supposed to be. And very, do they still have a really strong idea about what the appropriate female is and the appropriate male, or has that lessened over time? I mean, um, Dobson's books, Bringing Up Boys and Bringing Up Girls, from 2000 to 2010, are very gendered and very different expectations of what boys and girls are supposed to be like and be. Um, but has that changed at all in terms of expecting boys to also be kind and I mean, from the beginning, he's uh, Dobson has been very um, um, talked talked about how men should be more emotionally involved with the family. Like he's like, I'm looking. One of the things I'm looking at is how like the sense of fatherhood as a calling emerged, and how um, I mean, like Vandross, Dick Vandross, and Mark Hamilton talk about how ideas of motherhood became um, evangelical fundamental saw motherhood as a form of ministry. And it kind of shifted, I think. And Dobson was one of the like, earliest ones who thought like a man's primary uh, purpose in life is to evangelize his children, and that's like his primary calling. And you see, like also, um, you know, plenty of stories of um, husbands and fathers writing in books in the family about how um, being the provider and being like, working was a burden to them because it took away times to be with families. So there's like this idea that fathers had to be involved, had to be there, and you know, and Dobson says like, hey man, man you gotta, you know, step up. You have to, you know, talk to your husband and then talk to your wife and <laughs> That's, you wouldn't say that. It's all like emotional involvement. Uh, I mean, that's like one, of the, one of the things that um, uh, so, uh, a sociologist have like talked, looked at, um, gone in to talk to conservative women. Uh, so like, this is the one of the tools they have to demand that their husband come home for dinner, that they demand that their husband take part in their children's lives because, you know, see, Dobson says, this is your calling. This is your responsibility. This is what needs to be a man. You, have to, you know, you have to take out your children on dates, and, you know. So um, that's going to be a big change, I think, in this generation. Hi, I'm John. Um, some of us are at the age where our memories uh, go back to these events, and, and you perhaps know that Dr. Dobson's father was on faculty here at this institution uh, back in Pasadena days. And some of us are personally acquainted with him. Uh, and um, I, so there are many trails one could take with that background, but my impression of his uh, early days uh, uh, had to do with the, with Dr. Spock's uh, book, mm -hmm. books on permissiveness, and there was a real reaction to that. I don't know if you if you covered that at all or went into that, mm -hmm. uh, because as see, Dobson was a junior high counselor and made a speech to the uh, private schools association of Christian schools as a guest speaker once and. The publisher of Tyndale happened to be in the meeting and heard his speech, and that's when he said, you need to write a book. And that's how Gary Discipline started. And, uh, and so, but the reactionism against permissiveness was a big, big issue. I just wonder if you got into that. Yes, mm -hmm. definitely. And I mean, Derek Discipline is a, a deeply political book. It's known for being like the close banking book, but it's, it's a deeply political tract against permissiveness, against liberalism, against um, sovereignism, against, you know, uh, against um, you know, everything that has like, happened in the 60s. Would you say that it couldn't exist if the 60s hadn't been like it had been, I mean, with the counterculture? And, mm -hmm. You know, that's a counterfactual question, but, you know, could it, could it have existed if, if the 60s had been like the 50s? Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, because he, he writes against feminism. He writes mm -hmm. against, you know, it's like it couldn't exist in its form. Mm -hmm. so, uh, 
didn't know about that speech and how we got a book on track. Mm -hmm. Randall, speaking of the 60s, so um, you have a phrase that I, I'd like to hear more about because it, it surprised me kind of. You're talking about the Beatles in chapter three. Mm -hmm. And you uh, mention uh, it's the sentence you the gender confusion and social rebellion they inspired. I get the social rebellion. I'm not sure I understand the gender confusion exactly. Yeah. Unless I don't know if you're talking about some lyrics or the long yeah. hair or well, part of that or what you're thinking yeah, I mean, about. So this was a fascinating thing. I mean, I have to say, like it was, and to be, be able to do it here, you know, at, at Point Loma, it's really fun. And, and this is a great setup you have. But you know. Do, Reading about the Beatles and their and their impact, you know, yeah. it's just it's amazing. And so um, that has to do with the uh, the responses of evangelicals and conservatives all over the country, and also just people who aren't attached to the church about the Beatles, the novelty of their hair, hair in an era of kind of, of crew cuts. And right. Stuff. So there's the politics of hair, right. but I I was picking up in Southern Baptist and in other publications. Um, all sorts of talk about how, you know, it's like good Southern Baptist girls don't want to date someone who looks like a girl, uh, you know, they, and, and inspires them to scream and go wild. I wondered if, yeah, okay. They even knew, like these uh, religious writers who are writing against the Beatles, even knew that the kind of chaos that happened at, at the shows, especially, because they were mostly, these were mostly girls, young girls who were at the shows. But there was story after story about how the first two rows of girls Many of them would, would pee their pants, and so that, and so there was just like, it just smelled really bad <laughs> at the front of Beatles. Concert. But that's not really gender confusion. It's not. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm understanding. It's not. But but they, they the the, um, the response to that would be, these young ladies have have lost any sense of propriety and how True. to behave okay. themselves in public. Okay. Okay. And this group of men who wear tight trousers. <laughs> That in these suits that don't even have collars on them, uh, get up there and you know inspire them to this frenzy, and then it, okay. like beyond that, there's even um, a, quite a bit of talk about how the the I mean the, the I think I maybe used for the title of this or maybe it was a, a, a paper that I did spun off of it about how they inspired a new religion. It was like they inspired a new religion. That was what their uh, Derek Taylor, their their press uh, manager, said about them. Mm. Just seeing people, you know. The Beatles would talk about how they'd land in uh, Kansas City uh, in 1964 to perform at the, the uh, athletic stadium, and there'd be all these people lined up in wheelchairs who wanted to touch them, uh, who, who mm. thought that by touching them they uh, you know, could be maybe healed. And Lennon did some interviews about that, and uh, some very profane interviews with Rolling Stone after he didn't have to worry about being nice anymore. And you know, all of them talked about this. How it freaked them out that they reached this kind of divine, mm -hmm. this strange divine status. I mean, that's far from what you asked about originally. No, but that that helps. And that sounds like I mean, he he wrote a couple songs like that. You know, um, mm -hmm. post Beatles. Yeah, yeah. Can I, can I follow up just yeah. quickly, Mike? Too that yeah. these, um, in the early anti-rock literature, there's also this connection between. The beat, the, the jungle music beat, mm -hmm. and um, the Red Scare, that, that somehow the rock music is going to soften yes. American boys up so that they'll be susceptible mm -hmm. to leftist politics mm -hmm. and it will feminize them. And so the exactly. fear of homosexuality I is see. linked, is, is, there's a political link mm -hmm. to okay. the, the communist uh, <coughs> stuff mm -hmm. and, and the, uh, and the Kind of effeminate males yeah, are really yeah. close, in, but in, in ways that make no sense at all. For me. That's the thing. That, but um, but it, it's all through the, that early literature in the 1950s. Mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. that, is that one of these writers from the Christian Crusade, Billy James Hargis, very conservative anti-communist. One of his uh, writers with his organization was David Noble. Oh, he did yeah. all the just off the charts. Yeah, all the stuff about communism and the Beatles. But the connection is, this is a this is like one of those TV shows on PBS. <laughs> that makes mm -hmm, sense. Mm -hmm. The connection is that. Hargis set up uh, Summit Ministries in, in Colorado, which um, was an anti-communist training school, which now is closely linked to focus on the family, like they have these ties. So this is the bridge to our project. <laughs> yeah. 
I've been doing quite a bit of reading and talking about contemporary music, <clears throat> and uh, haven't come to any resolution. But uh, years ago, when I was teaching here uh, in contemporary British lit class, I said I like jazz. We were talking about the poet Philip Larkin, who liked jazz. But I said I really don't like rock. So I said, "What's rock about?" So three hands shot up, <coughs> and they said, uh, "Anger." And I was stunned. I said, anger at what? They said, broken homes. And I do feel that rock music would be too narrow to say it's just about anger. Mm -hmm. I do think it's about discontent mm -hmm. and, dis uh, uh, and uh, unhappiness with the world as it is, that it was given to them. Mm -hmm. And therefore, it's hard for me to relate to it, because um, I hear them expressing their anger and discontent and unhappiness, but it's hard for me to connect to that with worship. Mm. <coughs> well, can I ask another question? Oh, Is there a hand? Okay. I'm Michelle, and I just, what you were talking about after this question, what do you think was Lennon, why John Lennon said, that about Christ. I mean, yeah. what was his? He, uh, yeah. What did you think? You know, he was. He's really interesting because he was a dabbler. He was. A, he was sort of a dilettante about <laughs> religious, like reading stuff that was sort of religious studies. -y. You know, he I mean, and he described himself in that period in '65 and '66 as being a bored guy. He was eating a lot. They called him the Fat Beetle mm -hmm. because he, they were. That's the number one hits. They kept going to have steak dinners. But he read this book called uh, The Passover Plot. Uh, mm. which was sort of a conspiracy. I can't remember the author of this, but it was like, who was that? Mid-60s, I think, yeah. and it was a, this sort of conspiracy theory about Christ, that Jesus' ideas were fine, but it was his, his stupid apostles that mangled everything, got it all mixed up. And so Lenin was saying this stuff that was straight out of this Passover plot uh, book. You know, that's, he got it from that. And to his credit, I mean, and this is a has proven to be true, you know, he, this is at the time at the beginning of post-Christian Britain. It's this historian in the UK who's at an institution north of us, uh, Colin Brown, wrote this great book called The Death of Christian Britain. And it, it really is in the late 50s and early 60s when um, turnout churches is really going down. Uh, and in a way, Lenin, when he explained it, he said it's really probably more true of of uh, Britain than it is of the United States. And I think really he was right about that. And it's been yeah. proven right. Because I, I always I always felt he got more criticism for that than maybe he really deserved. Mm -hmm. And that I think he was maybe making a comment mm -hmm. on society, you know, at There's the time. One thing I want to do is, if it's not a complete waste of time, is to actually sort of track where the Beatle burnings were <coughs> and, and which radio yeah, stations. So these radio stations, the first one was in Alabama. They were heavily in the American South. They were heavily in the buckle regions of the Bible Belt. Um, and so kind of look at that, the geographic component. Thank you. Yeah. How far does the pendulum swing? You, you talked, and you kind of gave an interesting comparison in uh, the paper uh, about Brown versus Board of Education, the whole question of integration and segregation. Mm -hmm. and, and, and then as you follow it chronologically, you show them as, as war in camps and they kind of coming together a little bit with mm -hmm. Christian rock and, and the church and embracing you know Christian instruments and services and things yeah. like that. And, and to some degree, I guess, even like Kansas and some of the other popular groups would, would have somewhat Christian messages yeah. in, in, in the rock. But I'm interested in that epilogue idea that you were talking about. How has that gone now? Is there a, mm -hmm. a new ghettoization of Christian music or, or has yeah. it spread across, you know, there's a, there's a great book from the late 90s that's called Apostles of Rock that's written by two sociologists. And they do these, they do a great thing where they sort of categorize these different sort of areas that bands sit in. Mm -hmm. So like a band like U2 yeah. is radically different in whatever is their Christianity compared to a band like Audio Adrenaline or a band like Jars of Clay or um, Michael W. Smith, you know. They're, there's, there are ones that are kind of deep within the, uh, the sort of evangelical tradition. They play the, 
the circuits, the like Cornerstone yeah. and um, Creation Fest, and they are sold in Christian bookstores. And then there are those crossover artists that like, um, like what's her name? Uh, Amy Grant. Amy Grant. 